Hey, welcome to Capturing Christianity. I'm Cameron Bertuzzi, and today I'm joined by Dr. Tyler McNabb, and we're talking about world religions and how they relate to Christianity, how Christianity relates to other world religions. But first, before we get into that, I want to let you know about a couple things that are going on right now. First of all, there's always these free resources that I've got linked in the description of this video. Let me see if I can actually pull them up. They're not pulling up on my screen. Of course not. If you if you go to the link in the description of this uh, the, the free resources, there's a free ebook that I want to give you. It's 60 page ebook, the rationality of Christian theism, and then there's another ebook, the uh, it's apologetics terms for beginners. It's a whole list of like a hundred, over a hundred terms. If you're new to apologetics and like some of the terms that get used they get used a lot, like they're kind of confusing to you, then this is a perfect resource for you. So go check that again. These are completely free. Go check it out in the link in the description. Okay, so that out of the way, let's go ahead and just jump right into the interview with Dr. Tyler McNabb. And unfortunately, he is still actually suffering some symptoms from COVID. So uh, be in, be in prayer for him, especially if you're watching this live. But uh, Tyler, it's great to have you back on the show. I can't wait to, to talk about religions with you today. Thanks, man. It's been too long, and uh, I look forward to hopefully hanging out with you when I'm not COVID positive. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, hopefully in the, in the near future. Um, so thank you very much. Yeah. So why don't we just jump right into the topic and you've got some things that you have planned to, to share with us. So let's just jump right in and, and kind of like what we're doing today. I'll just say this is that we're discussing those. Are there any overlaps between other world religions like Confucianism, Taoism, Hinduism, Buddhism and Christianity? Is there any kind of overlap between like, is it possible to believe, for example, that God exists and that Buddhism is true or whatever? You know, so there's right. there's a lot of interesting questions here about kind of like the the overlaps between these uh, these worldviews because traditionally it's been viewed as like no you can't be a classical theist or you can't be a, a neoclassical theist and also adopt you know the the main core tenets of like Buddhism or Hinduism whatever and so but you have a paper and you have a, a actually a couple papers on this that have been uh, pretty interesting and so wh why don't we get into uh, the meat of the topic here and I'll, I'll just let you take it away from here. Yeah, man. Um, so, uh, first off, like I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian, right? And so I think it's really important that we talk about how Christians should view other religions, right? Um, and yeah, that's uh, a good place I, to start. To, <laughs> um, to no surprise, all right. Uh, uh, your, regarding your viewers, I'm specifically a Catholic Christian, <laughs> and so what I'm going to be drawing from are going to be a lot of kind of. Um, uh, Catholic theologians and Catholic uh, official Catholic teaching and so forth. So, nonetheless, I think what I'm going to paint is a, a plausible model, even for your Protestant viewers. Um, and so, uh, I ho hopefully, you judge the model based off of um, uh, its plausibility <laughs> rather than you know it's just because it's Catholic, and so you know let's let's uh, let's ignore it or something like that. But. Uh, yeah, okay. So um, when we look at the Gospels, like, let, let's go there first, right? Um, Gerald O'Collins has a volume uh, called Christology of Religions, the Christology of Religions. It's, it's a really great small book um, that uh, I highly recommend, you know, your 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 listeners to, to get a hold of. I can get it on Amazon. It's a real, real small, neat book. And uh, in uh, Christology of Religions, uh, sorry, my sons just came into the. Uh... <laughs> hey guys, come on. Yeah, no worries. Go. <laughs> follow mommy. Ezra, follow mommy, buddy. Sorry, so sorry about this. Live TV. Uh, yeah, no what worries. can you say, right? <laughs> yeah, man. And kids, um, I mean, and so I'm sure like part of you of, wanted to like, like religions. You know, he looks at the Gospels and he looks at like the Syrophoenician woman. He looks at like the Centurion. Um, and he, he, he looks at Jesus' interactions with them. And, and what does he see? He, he, he ends up endorsing their faith, right? He ends up talking about how, how great their faith is. Um, and, you know, with, with, the, uh, with, with the woman, at first he acts like Gentiles, you know. <laughs> they're, they're just dogs, right? But he ends up saying, no, like, your, your faith is so great. Um, uh, you know, uh, your, your faith has, has made you well. Right. Uh, in, in fact, he, he when he talks about um, uh, the Gentiles faith, he says that there are going to be people who aren't you normally wouldn't think are at the, the seat of Jacob, <laughs> Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, you know, eating with them. Right. 
uh, but but they're going to be there. And and he talks about how uh, the the faith of uh, the Gentiles, like in, in really high esteem terms. And so I think that's really important that he praises the the faith of Gentiles, people who aren't you know Jews, who aren't orthodox in an orthodox way, worshiping the God of Israel. Um, he talks about having sheep, right, that that aren't of this fold. And yet, nonetheless, they will come to listen to Jesus. They, they, they will hear his voice. Uh, and so I think when, when we kind of take these passages together, right, what does Jesus end up saying? It's those who do the will of the Father who will be right with God, right? It's those who do the will of the Father who, who will be right. Um, not, you know, only those Orthodox Jews who do the will of the Father or uh, you know, Confucians or Buddhists or Christians, uh, but those who do the will of the Father. I think there is a wide mercy when we look at the Gospels and, and see Jesus' interactions with um, uh, people who come from um, non-Jewish uh, backgrounds. And so I think I think that's that's really in, important. Um, you can do a yeah, whole and this seems relevant. There's, there's a whole debate whether or not Romans is is indicating that you can be um, right with God um, apart from divine revelation and so forth. I'm not going to get into that here, but I, I do want to kind of to 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 emphasize uh, the gospel's um, praise appraisal of uh, Gentile faith and and its its recommendation that people can be, um, you know. Inheriting the kingdom of God by the will of the Father, um, anyone who does the will of the Father, right? But at the same time, right, we're Christians. And so I think that passages like John 14, 6, right? Jesus says he's the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father but through him. Um, I think that's like, that's a, that's a pretty important passage. <laughs> uh, that, that, that's, that's something essential to Christianity, is that Jesus is the only way to God. Right, or you have passages like uh, uh, in Acts four, four, uh, four, four, twelve. Right, salvation is found in no one else. There's no other name under heaven given to mankind in which we must be saved. Right, it's Jesus's name. Right, no one's gonna be saved under anyone's name but Jesus. And so, uh, you know, you look at the apostles and preaching in the Book of Acts. And they, they seem quite clear on this. Jesus is who saves. Jesus um, is, is, is the one in, in which uh, you know, the, the world becomes redeemed. The cosmos is reconciled to God. And so we can't let the, that, that go. We can't let these, these passages, these doctrines go when we are um, uh, doing theology, when, when, we're, when we're looking at other religious traditions. So I think that, that's really important. We look at the wider mercy of Christ in, in the Gospels, and, 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 and yet at the same time, we, we stick with those clear passages that, that make it uh, clear that Jesus is exclusively the way to Yahweh, the way to God. Yeah, um, so this, and, this and gets so into how some... How can we kind of reconcile these, these two positions, right, where we want to have a wider mercy a wider acceptance of those who can be right with God, those who can be saved, but at the same time, stick with the passages that are so clear about Jesus' exclusivity. Right? Hey, how, how Tyler, can you hear that? me? So, and you might wonder, even um, in the early church, right? There, there's this um, saying that became really famous, right? Uh, there's no salvation outside of the church, right? How, how, do, how do we make sense of this? Uh, as well, if we're going to grant that people from other religious traditions could be following God, could be worshiping God, can 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 go to heaven, right? How can we make sense of that? Well, I think it's it's really important that we, um, you know, we we look at uh, church history when uh, and and what the fathers believed at the time when this sort of saying was uh, being. Um, uh, made known, right? And so, you know, you look at uh, Gregory Nyssa, you look at Chrysostom, you look at Ambrose, and they all believe actually <laughs> that, um, I think even early Augustine, though not later Augustine, um, 
believed that the gospel had gone out, that the gospel had gone forth um, uh, to, uh, to the whole world. And, and that, that, that uh, the gospel was accessible to everyone and that everyone would be judged by um, uh, their, their uh, accepting of the gospel or, or not. Um, Cam, can you hear me still? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Because I can't hear you, Cameron. Yeah, there's. Ugh. I'm gonna have to uh, to send him another message. Sorry, guys. This there's actually there ha we haven't had a uh, technical difficulty like this in, in a, a while. Bit of a pickle. You want me to continue yeah. to go on, Cameron, or do you want me to? Can you <laughs> technical difficulties? More live yeah. television. Hang on, guys. I'm actually about to send him uh, a text. So one second, just bear with me. Okay, he says to keep going. So <laughs> um, I guess he'll try to figure out what's going on on his end. Um, yeah, so, um, uh, so, so, you know, what happens though when the new world is discovered, right? When the new world is discovered, uh, things, things, things change, right? You realize that there's hundreds of thousands of people who haven't heard of Christ. And who died? What are we going to do with them? Right? Are we just going to say they're all damned? Um, and immediately, and I mean immediately, we see uh, uh, this this theology develop that that there is hope for them. That those who don't know Christ, to no fault of their own, they can be saved. Right? And, and you see this uh, uh, theology develop. Uh, and, and take place, right, all the way through Vatican II, where uh, in Lumen Gentium, we see, uh, in uh, 16 specifically, we see that those who, no fault of their own, don't know Christ or his holy church, but nonetheless respond by God from God's grace. God grace hits them first, it's not Pelagian, and they respond to the light that they have that points to Christ that they, they, it's possible that they can be saved. So it's similar to like an Abraham, right? Um, Abraham is said to believe the gospel. Um, but obviously Abraham didn't like consciously, <laughs> wasn't consciously aware of the gospel uh, in, in any robust sense, right? So in the same way though, trusting in the light that they have that points to Christ is they're, they're believing in the gospel. And uh, other documents of Vatican II talk about how um, you know, all truth is God's truth. And other religious traditions have truth, have God's truth, right? And that truth is holy, found in those other religious traditions. It's holy truth. Uh, and um, not only is it is it holy truth, but it, it's putting them in touch with divinity, right? It, it's it's putting them in touch, and it's 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 laying the foundation and pointing to Christ. So um, <clears throat> when, when, you, when you look at these religious traditions, all right, he says it's on my end. All right, so I'm going to try to take the maybe AirPods out and see if... Um, Can you hear me now? Let's see. Sorry, guys. I know I kind of like paused him while he was in the mid mid thought again. But yeah, the issue, I mean, everyone can hear me fine. So we're just trying to work through this with, uh, with Sorry, Tyler. Let's see if he can, yeah, let's see if he can get the right thing selected here. We'll just wait a, another minute or so and then we'll get back <laughs> into it. Um, maybe I'll get away from my Yeti mic. Let's see if that works. Check one, two. Can you hear me, Cameron? Yeah, I can hear you. No, can't hear me, I guess. Um, 
What about now? Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. All right. <laughs> he tells me just to keep going. Should should I log out, Cameron, and log back in? Maybe that'll work. Okay, I'm gonna log out and log. All right, guys. Sorry about the uh, the technical issues. I mean, like I said, we haven't had a, a technical issue like this in quite a while. So uh, Tyler is coming back in, and we'll see if we can get him connected now. All right, now it's saying he's in the green room, and I have no idea why. Oh my goodness, we may just have to reschedule this. <laughs> He can't, I can't, now I can't hear him or see him at all. Let me see if I can pull him up here. There, there you go. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, good. Wow. I don't know what happened. <laughs> all right. Well, I mean, now we're, now we're here and fortunately I can, uh, I can cut out a lot of this yeah, from yeah, yeah. the, uh, from the actual video itself. So why don't you just continue if you remember where you left off and just go right, ahead and continue. Right. Yeah. So um, Vatican II, um, you know, talks about how these these truths and other religions are are holy, and how because uh, it's Christ, it's pointing to Christ. These truths and rituals that can be found in other traditions, you know, if they're good, right? If they're if they're beautiful, the true, good, beautiful, right? Um, then you know they they point to God, they point to Christ, and so um, yeah, th th this is a much more optimistic view, right? of how we should view other religious traditions. It's, it's not like, oh, they're from another religious tradition, right? They're not Christian, they're going to hell. And and all of their religious views are are bad, right? Um, they're, they're harmful to society. We should com completely, you know, see, see no redeeming value in these religious traditions. Um, it, it's not that way at all. It's an optimism that, that um, perhaps implicitly they are trusting in Christ. And, and they're entrusting in Christ by trusting in the light and the truths that they have that point to Christ, right? Assuming that, um, you know, they don't know better, right? And, and so it, it's looking at other religious views and traditions in, in, in a much more positive light. And so I think that as we as Christians, um, having, uh, you know, this sort of vision, I think, benefits us, right? I'm an evangelist at heart. Cameron knows this. Um, I'm, I'm an evangelist at heart. I, I want to see the gospel go forth and, and preached. Well, I'll tell you what, <laughs> when you say, hey, uh, I, I can agree with a lot of what you're saying, and you can agree with a lot of what I'm saying. Now, let's add the gospel here. Now I'm going to present the claims of Jesus and, and uh, uh, declare, you know, the, 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 the gospel to you and, and, and provide evidence for the gospel. And now it's 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 you're looking at the gospel as something that you can sort of add on, not that you have to radically transform your prior religious commitments, right? Not that like oh all your religious views and philosophical views they're all wrong. You need to radically change the way you view the world uh, entirely. And so so it's it's getting away from that, and it's saying let's go ahead and see to what extent um, our our views. Can can agree and, and and can be seen as in unison and on the same on the same level because that's going to uh, bring down obstacles that are there when proclaiming the gospel. Does that make sense, Cameron? Yeah, sorry, I'm still a little bit just out of uh, out of it with the uh, the technical issues that just occurred. So I I, it, I was trying to go back and forth and try to like remember what you were saying and then also kind of work through the issues in my head. And so, uh, sorry, I just haven't been able to, to really track no worries, man. to, to, as long as it sounds like, as long as you're telling a coherent story in your own mind, <laughs> yes, uh, that, <laughs> that's going to be okay. That's going to be sufficient for the audience. So, uh, I, I apologize about all the technical issues we've had guys. It's, uh, it is what it is. Sometimes they happen. So, um, while we're paused, why don't I go ahead and take this time to talk about my friend, Mark Lozano over at Christ centered capital. I've talked about him a few times and uh, there's been a big change in what their business model actually changed to very recently. So if you haven't heard about Christ Centered Capital, what he does 
is it's basically an ethical screening of financial assets like stocks and cryptos and everything. So like if you're investing in something and you don't really know like what the ethical ramifications are of your investments in this company, this is the type of thing that he like, he vets all of these different companies, all these different assets and makes sure, and makes sure that what you're investing in, what you're putting your money into actually lines up with your Christian morality. And that's like the service that he provides. But what's changed recently is before it was like a $7 a month subscription fee in order to get like the newsletter and everything else that he puts out on a weekly basis of like all the different financial assets. And so what they've changed to is it's completely free. Like it's completely free now, completely 100% free. All you have to do is just go to the website. I've got it pulled up here and uh, you just type in your name and that's it. It's like, that, the reason why he actually changed to uh, to going to a free business model, completely free, is he got some testimonials in from people who completely took all of their money out of things that they were investing in that they just learned were uh, were unethical. And so that now they're putting all of their money into Christian, ethically, how do I even, how do I, what's the right way to say this? Good, ethical, <laughs> I still can't think of a good way to put it. Uh, things that line up with their Christian morality and financial assets that line up with their Christian morality. And he, he was just so moved by the testimonials of people who have been changed by the work that he's doing that he was like, you know what? This just needs to be a free service to everybody. So go check him out, ChristCenteredCapital.com. Uh, Mark as well, he's just a solid dude. He's a, he's a Christian. He was an atheist for a while and then he actually accepted Christ. And his story is really cool and how he was in the NBA. And then uh, when he became a Christian, he like decided that he needed to start investing in actually things that are that line up with his Christian morality, and that's how the business whole started and everything. It's a really really cool story. I'm going to be interviewing him in person actually not too long from now, so that's going to be really cool. Stay tuned for that. But yeah, you need to go check him out. Christcenteredcapital.com, completely free now. All you got to do to, in order to get all of the the cool information that he's sending out to everybody. And you, I mean, if you're investing, you need to be interested in this. You've got to be interested. In what you're putting your money into, it's got to line up with your Christian morality, and so yeah, that's uh, that's what we've got going on. It's a big change, really cool stuff happening over at ChristCenterCapital.com. Go check them out. I've got a link in the description of this video as well. All right, let's get back into the interview. So Tyler, where should we go from here? And why don't you do this to help me out? Why yeah. don't you just summarize what you've just said right. to help right. me out, and then it'll also help the the audience out, I'm sure as well. And then sure. we'll get into the uh, to the rest of what you've got to to share with us. Sure. Yeah. So um, kind of started off by talking about how should a Christian look at other religious traditions, right? So on, on, on one, um, uh, one way over here, we could say that, you know, all religions that aren't Christian are bad and evil and have no truth at all. And, and uh, in order to convert someone to Christianity, we need to get them to radically uh, change their ways and how they view the world, Um and uh, uh, you know, see what they're doing right now is unholy, right? And on the other side, right? You of course you 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 could have the opposite issue, which is just like uh, everyone's you know has the has a, a whole bunch of truth, and um, no one has more truth than anyone else, and they're all on the same path. And there's um, you know, I'll keep believing in Jesus, you keep believing in whatever you're believing in. No no need to convert each other, and uh, you know uh, we'll, we'll just see. What happens at the end, right? And I'm trying to avoid both <laughs> of of uh, of these sides, and I'm, I'm trying to to put in a nice nice comfy middle here. And <clears throat> I'm I'm articulating uh, what I take to be the uh, Catholic view of how we should look at other religious traditions. Um, and so, using Gerald O'Collins mentioning his work about looking at um, uh, different gospel encounters where J Jesus encounters a Gentile and praises their faith, says their faith is like better than everyone else's faith, <laughs> says it it's 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 those who will be doing the will of the Father that will be getting into heaven, um, not necessarily the will of the Father plus whatever your religious tradition is and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, uh, in that, uh, uh, you know, he praises Gentile, non-Orthodox followers of Yahweh uh, in, in really high regard. And so, uh, you know, taking that uh, approach to religious traditions, kind of modeling our own approach after this high appraisal view in which Jesus is, um, seemed to be given in, in the Gospels. Um, and, and, and yet at the same time, 
not leaving the John 14, 6, right? No, no one comes to the Father but through Christ. In Acts 4, right? No other name is anyone saved, right, by the name of Jesus. So keeping these passages still together, and how can we understand or reconcile um, uh, these, these passages with yet a, a, a optimism about other people becoming uh, 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 saved or, or, or getting right with God. Um, and so here's, here's this idea that, um, uh, uh, that, that those who um, God's grace moves upon them first, right? Again, I'm avoiding plagianism here <laughs> and uh, in semi-plagianism. And, and, and through that, um, they respond in a positive way, right? They trust in what, what they've been given. What, what they know to be true that points to Jesus. In the same way, they can be said to be trusting in the gospel. Uh, and it was just like Abraham trusted in the gospel in the Old Testament, even though he didn't really <laughs> uh, have anything uh, close to a clear depiction of the gospel, right? Um, and so, you know, and, and we can sort of make this approach um, uh, it, it, plausible, historically speaking, because um, it's not something like new that just came up in, in the 20th century, right? You see this, this view emerge right when the new world is discovered. And if you're wondering why church fathers like Chrysostom and Ambrose and Gregory Nyssa and stuff, um, well, you know, why weren't they articulating this view more or whatever? They, they thought that the whole world had already heard the gospel. <laughs> and so, you know, it, it's, it's not until the new world discovery that that's obviously just shown to, to not be the case. And so um, you see this doctrine develop. And as all doctrine, the doctrine develops. And so I think it's, you have this plausible um, approach, how we can, can, can see other religions, uh, other religious practitioners, and, and view them in a very positive light, uh, in, 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 in a light that you know, we see that they have truths that point to Christ, truths that lay the foundation, rituals that lay the foundation that point to Christ, um, that, that allow them to get in contact with divinity himself. Um, and, and so it's, it's, it's allowing us to appreciate their traditions and, 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 and allowing us to, to, to have common ground and say, like, you don't need to change everything about you and, and all your medical views. You don't have to uh, utterly, um, you know, start over again. Um, no, but what you do need to add is, is Jesus. And, and so let's go ahead and see to what extent, to what extent, um, can religious other religious traditions be can be seen as consistent with theism and so that's that's what i want to do today is i want to talk about how on buddhism and uh hinduism specifically aveda vedanta hinduism um, which i take to be these, these are kind of like the two hardest cases um, if for anyone who's familiar with these religious traditions um i think confucianism and taoism is much easier to make sense of theism um i'll talk about those very briefly but uh uh yeah, so if we're looking at kind of like the, the two most unlikely <laughs> religious traditions that we could be seen as consistent with classical theism, you know, let, let, let's you, you use these as a, a, a test case, right? And see if these religious traditions could be made consistent with classical theism in much of the Judeo-Christian teaching. Um, and if so, then I, I think that's going to affect how we evangelize and, and should affect um, uh, to what extent you know, we try to um, um, do apologetics and so forth. So is, is this any clear to you, Cameron? Very clear now. And yeah, it makes, because I was going to ask you, like, why are you even interested in this question? And now that you've tied it back into evangelism, that makes a lot of sense. So yeah, it's, exactly. uh, it's, it's a lot clearer. And, and it's kind of like an eat the meat, spit out the bones kind of approach to these other world religions. And I, I really like that. I think that's really cool. Looks like Tyler, you there? Awesome. All right. So, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. I'm, I'm good to go? Good to go. I can keep talking? Okay. <clears throat> All right. So, um, right. Let's, you know, Taoism, uh, I'm not going to get into too much of the details here. Um, if you're familiar with the Taoist tradition, though, oftentimes in the academic literature, there's a demarcation between the um, uh, religious Taoist tradition and philosophical Taoism. 
but there's been some some really positive archaeological findings um, that show that actually um, in in um, uh, in in, in more ancient times, the, the religion wasn't separated from the philosophy so much. And the ineffable Tao uh, was seen as the source of all creation and is given like personal um, predicates, <laughs> predicated personal attributes or, or um, um, uh, properties, that, that sort of thing. Um, and so uh, I, I do think there's going to be a strong link that you can make with Taoism and um theism of course you, you also have within confucianism um i think that you know it's, it's when i was in china so i i i teach i'm at the university of saint joseph in macau the only catholic university in china and um uh so i've been living there i'm not there currently right now i'm in texas but uh you know i've been living there and it's very common to say things like oh um chinese tradition philosophical tradition uh, is not theistically friendly. You know, theism and Chinese philosophy don't mix. But I, I think as Kelly James Clark has um, kind of brilliantly pointed out, and he's got a new book on this forthcoming with Bloomsbury, I highly recommend it. Um, that's just not the case. So you you have the Shang dynasty uh, clearly referring to worshiping, up, right? Um, referring to uh, Shang Di or Di um as as this high god and then the dynasty that, that, that comes after um you you have uh, again it's it's sort of taking its its influence from the shang dynasty and and confucius comes uh out of this influenced by all of this and you look at his analects and you see i believe it's analects uh, six and seven where he talks about heaven he, he he personalizes heaven and talks about how heaven can judge him Tian can judge him. And he talks about how um, uh, that, that um, uh, heaven's responsible for giving him virtue, for giving him virtue in his heart, giving him that disposition. So he, he talks about heaven in, in personalistic ways um, that, that theists would be quite, you know, big fans of. And, and you know, Moses, his, uh, you know, the person comes right after Confucius, um, uh, you know, he talks about, uh, um, heaven and, 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 and God and so forth in, in personalistic ways. And, you know, you, you do see theism, I think, plausibly found in Chinese traditions as well. So let's look at two traditions that I take to be, um, uh, kind of a hard, harder traditions to argue that there's going to be consistency, <laughs> that there's going to be. Um, consistency between theism and, and that particular religious tradition. So I, I do want to make a quick point here um, and, and say that I think you're going to have to end up endorsing classical theism to make the same, the sort of arguments that I'm going to make here. So I'm sorry for all my neoclassical theist friends, <laughs> theistic personals friends who um, want to see God as, um, as a, a, a being among other beings, a thing among other things. Uh, who 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 want to see God as made up of various properties and mutable and 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 passable? Um, what, what what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to talk about how classical theism, right, the view that God, God is pure act, um, no potentiality in God at all, right? He's not a composite, uh, so he's immutable in a strong sense, not in that weak sense, right, where it's just like. Oh, he's he's immutable in the sense that he's good and ever changingly good, right? No, but like he's he's immutable in a very strong sense, wholly immutable. Um, no potentiality in him. That means no potential to act upon him. He's impassable, right? And then he's metaphysically simple. He's not a composite, not made up of parts, right? His omniscience just his it just is his omnibenevolence, which just is his all the other um, predicates you want to give to him, which is just his uh, existence. God is existence itself. He is not a being among other beings. He's not a thing. Um, uh, he is existence itself, right? So this is the sort of conception of God um, that that I think can be made these other religious traditions. Um, and so I'm going to say something that might shock your viewers, <laughs> but um, trust me, I'm, I'm, I'm 
I try to be a faithful Catholic in, in my, my view, so don't worry, I'm still Christian. <laughs> but God is not a person. Right? God is not a person. Because God can't be put, at least in any univocal sense, right? God can't be put in a box, the same category as you and I, right? Um, and so while there might be personal um dimensions of God or or where we can we can understand God analogically is personal, right? Um, the the idea is that um, uh, God isn't a person in the same way you and I are persons, right? And this is why I can say like following uh, the Neoplatonic tradition and David Bentley Hart and others saying like God is no thing. He's nothing, right? Again, that, that sounds crazy, I know. Uh, but but all uh, I'm not denying ex existence itself. I'm not denying pure actuality. What I'm doing is I'm denying that God is to be put in the same sort of category as as as, as you and I. Something that can be labeled. Something that um, is just some sort of genus, right? <coughs> uh, so anyway, um, assuming this is is, it, is this clear, Cameron, in reference to what I'm going to be assuming here? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, all right, let's, so I have a, a, a book with Eric Baldwin um, called Classical Theism and Buddhism. And this just came out uh, this past February, right? And um, in this book, we look at what we call mere Buddhism. We try to take what uh, Jay Garfield, for those who are familiar with his work, um, he's got a great book called Engaging Buddhism and um, highly highly recommend um, that for those who are interested in um, the Buddhist tradition. And he, he takes, uh, he has this nice summary of what's, what's centrally, um, um, how to say this, what, what, what's, what's at the heart, what are the fundamentals of Buddhism, right? Hold on one second, I'm sorry, I'm being interrupted again by my son. Deepest apologies. Yeah, no worries, no worries. Yes, baby, I gotta go, buddy. <laughs> Well, just, just, just go in there for now. Okay. Tell her you don't have to. Okay. Okay. Hey, Love if you, you if you need to, if you need to go, that's totally cool. It's totally, if Whoa, you need to like no, go no, pick no, him no. up and take him to the other room. Okay. Yeah, no, no I have, no, I have small kids, so I know how it is. I, I like, I was trying to tell you that earlier when the audio was like not working. I was like, I yeah, totally, yeah, yeah. I like, I have a small child or I have like a, oh. a young boy myself and like, yeah, I know how it is. So uh, it's no, it's no issue at all. Indeed. So well, hopefully sorry. that, sorry hopefully that. that, yeah. Yeah, no, hopefully the audience uh, appreciates that. <laughs> five kids, five kids, so, you know. Um, five. Yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, so, so, you know, largely from the Four Noble Truths, Garfield's kind of summarizing, um, which I think, which makes his, his sort of summary of Buddhism or what we call mere Buddhism, right, kind of after Lewis's mere Christianity. Um, yeah. Really plausible that this is indeed what mere Buddhism is, because I think he sticks so closely to the Four Noble Truths. Um, but basically, what's what's uh, the, the metaphysical views that are essential, the fundamental to Buddhism, are the doctrines of impermanence and interdependence. And so basically, think impermanence, that, that everything is, is, is changing from moment to moment, and nothing keeps its identity when it changes. So think of like Leibniz as law of identity, but like on steroids right? So who you are today is not who you were yesterday, not who you are tomorrow, right? If there's something new added to you or taken away, right, you're not the same person, right? You're not the same thing. And so you, you have um, so, sort of radical impermanence. Um, you know, things don't keep their identity over time. Um, and you also have this uh, imper uh, interdependence thesis. Everything is conceptually um, causally dependent on something else, on another. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, when you when you talk about this, if you endorse these two theses, you end up with the idea that uh, ultimately <laughs> things are empty, right? Um, empty of own being, at least if being is understood in uh, a permanent and in independent way. And so, uh, it's, it's easy to see why Buddhism then seems at odds with theism. Um, because God is supposed to be immutable, <laughs> not um, 
impermanent, <laughs> and he's supposed to be utterly dependent, right? Um, he's ase, right? He's a seity. He's not dependent on his own properties, on his own, on, uh, he's not dependent on his creation, right? Uh, conceptually, causally, right? God is. And so obviously, if you take these two theses, uh, they're gonna, it's going to be seen as, as inconsistent with, with theism. Um, so what do we do here? Right. And in Buddhist tradition, there is a, a nice philosophical tradition that like argues against God's existence through like the problem of evil, um, through various causal principles and, and, and metaphysics that, that were taken as plausible at the time. Right? There's this whole literature that, that grows up, these, this anti-theist Buddhist literature. Right? So you know, what, what, do we, what do we do with this? Well, if we construe... so what um you know if you look at contemporary analytic buddhist philosophers like jay garfield like um uh, jan westerhoff like um, um burton um, they apply impermanence and interdependence to things or objects or phenomena but if you're a classical theist in the sort of brian father brian davis or david bentley hart type you're not going to, to construe God as a thing or an object or phenomena. You're going to see God um, as a no thing. Um, God is not a, a being that can come to possess properties. He's not a thing. And so um, uh, when, when, we, when we construe God like this, well, then guess what? Interdependence and impermanence, they don't apply to God. And so... Um, the whole, all of things, all the realm of existent things could be impermanent and interdependent. Um, but yet, um, the grounding of the realm of existent things, right, doesn't have to be. Um, and, and when you look at the Buddhist philosophical literature, right, um, you, you look, it seems like a lot of what they're getting at, just arguing that doesn't exist, is a much more neoclassical or theistic personalist conception of God that they're arguing against. Not this kind of neoplatonic, Aristotelian, um, classical theism on steroids type view that I've espoused here today. Um, of course, you can, you can object. Um, Father Rooney has an article in Religious Studies that... Um, um, his problem with the sort of move that I make here with Buddhism is that um, he, he doesn't like this conception of God that I've articulated. He thinks it's not faithful to um, uh, what he takes to be classical theism and so forth. And so you can you can argue against it in, on different grounds. But, but if you take this conception of God, it seems like the basic core metaphysical tenets of Buddhism are compatible or consistent with classical theism. Now, again, I'm not arguing that Buddhists Buddhism, more generally, is not atheistic. It obviously very much is, right? Um, uh, most, all Buddhists, except for uh, maybe one or two that I know, um, are, are atheists. Um, but I, I'm arguing that if you understand Buddhism in this particular way, then, then that gives us grounds to see how it can be consistent with classical theism. One, one other quick objection to mention real quick that we deal with in the volume, you might say that no, interdependence and impermanence need to apply to all things that exist, uh, not just things, existence itself, right? Impermanence and interdependence need to apply to existence itself um, in any and all ways, right? Um, well, we don't think this fits naturally with the Four Noble Truths nor um, Buddha's um, kind of agnosticism toward metaphysical views more generally. This is a pretty loaded metaphysical view. Um, so anyway, if you want to see where we go with that, you can see the volume for that. But but, but he, here is how we can look at um, our Buddhist friends and neighbors and see um, you know what they're believing and, and saying, hey, listen, if we look at it this way, then you can be theist too. And then you 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 have major obstacle down for the gospel to go forward. Does that make sense? Yeah, sorry about that. I was uh, I was just thinking about Buddhism and uh, Platonism, actually, and I was wondering if those two are consistent with each other. Because I mean, depending on how you take the the two theses, what are the what are the two that are supposedly incompatible? Is it, it interdependence <laughs> and imper impermanence and interdependence? Yeah, interdependence and impermanence. 
Yeah, I mean, it seems to me like that would, like, the most natural understanding of that thesis, of the Buddhist thesis, would be applied to, like, it, that That would apply to contingent things. It wouldn't necessarily apply to things that exist necessarily. Because things mm -hmm. that exist necessarily, like, say, for instance, numbers, like, do those really depend on each other? Do they, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know that the Buddhists would necessarily want to rule out by fiat platonism you know like mathematical yeah so platonism. you do have a strong nominalist tradition in certain in certain um buddhist uh traditions um uh, see but that seems for, weird like if you're Buddhism. if you're gonna argue like if if platonism is something you've got to like rule out to be buddhist that seems like the price tag for buddhism seems seems to be higher mm. yeah um yeah, so so, I guess you would have to take that up with a Buddhist who's sympathetic to nominalism. I'm not I'm not a Buddhist nor a nominalist, so. <laughs> um, uh, you, you'll get, well, I just see the connection more. there. I see a connection between yeah. their view of abstract objects and mm -hmm. these these two theses. So it seems yeah. it seems like they would have to be a nominalist in order to adopt the the really strong version of that of of those right. two theses. Yeah, and so I mean, you even get like Westerhoff arguing that um, you know there can't be jointly necessary and sufficient conditions for warrant for knowledge, um, because that assumes that there are things that um, are not empty, that that are independent and and permanent, you know. And so you know he ends up endorsing like a non-realist view of epistemology even. So, I mean, yeah, they, they do go, you know, quite uh, down the rabbit hole, at least from um, the sort of traditions that I'm, I've become accustomed to. Something else that that would seem to rule out is like the existence of a necessary universe like that. So like Graham Oppie's mm -hmm. view wouldn't be open to them, that the right. universe is sort of necessary kind of thing. Yeah, it, it would need to, it's conceptually dependent and uh, causally dependent on other things. And it's not the same universe. <laughs> and so. Um, well, it's also it's not changes. permanent, right? It can't be, per yeah, exactly. it can't be permanent. So that, I mean, in his view is like one of the best options out there for atheists. So if, if they can't adopt his view, they're going to be in trouble. Yeah, well, I think his view is very modally implausible, but you know, what, what can you do if you're an atheist? So, um, <laughs> so let, let's, um, uh, yeah, go ahead and take it to, where, to the next, yeah. Yeah, so go, go to, to Hinduism, right? So um, for those who aren't familiar with Hinduism at all, like there's lots of different traditions, right, of Hinduism. Um, there are traditions that are like the Madhva traditions, which basically look identical to neoclassical theism. <coughs> Sorry. Um, but, you know, uh, combined with Hindu co traditional Hindu cosmology and stuff. Um, there's traditions that are more panentheistic. There's the tradition that I want to look at is uh, from a philosopher named Shankara. And I think he's really, really brilliant, really, really smart. And he's kind of what I take to be like, like the Aquinas, uh, Thomas Aquinas of the Aveda Vedante tradition and, and uh, maybe even of Hinduism more generally. Um, and uh, so uh, it's a typical way in how contemporary analytic philosophers will gloss his view, um, they'll, they'll, they'll talk about there are three layers of reality. Right? You have the, the third layer of reality, which is the layer in which we are experiencing right now. Right? Um, the layer in which we see objects, very diverse objects, um, people, persons, right? Uh, this is a water bottle here and a phone here and, you know, COVID in me, right? Um, and then you, you have at the second layer of reality, it, the, the microscope sort of further goes in and, and what we see is God, uh, God as, as being ultimate. But it's God still seen through a, a, a theistic personal sort of lens where God is made up of lots of properties and categories and we, we, we we're imposing our different... Um, presuppositions on God and, and, and see God as radically personal. And then you have the, the first layer, ultimate reality, right? Where um, God um, is the all um, uh, qualityless, propertyless Brahman. And oftentimes the word impersonal um, is, is thrown around, though I don't 
think you actually need to do that or I think that's not actually helpful to, to call it that, but you see the, these various layers of reality. And so the, the idea is that we need to get our um, minds right to, to, to recognize reality for how it actually is, right? That all is the impersonal um, quality that's property to Brahman. And so um, there's a really great book I recommend, Knowing Beyond Knowledge. Um, where, you know, in it, he, he utilizes, plan, uh, Thomas, he utilizes Plantinga's work. And um, he talks about how, you know, uh, in order to get from layer three to realization of layer one, um, we need cognitive proper function. We need, um, you know, gurus and the Vedas, they all have design plans and they all need to be following their design plans. And, and our mental processes need to be following their design plans that allow us to, when we faithfully read the Vedas and follow the gurus, um, we're able to recognize ultimate reality. And then we have this internal access that, uh, that um, and we, we, we see Brahman, um, we see ultimate reality, right? We have right realization. We know beyond what we know. And, and here is um, salvation. Here's how salvation is obtained. All right. And so you might think, well, how is this view? How could this view be consistent with theism, right? I mean, it's, it's impersonal <coughs> um, right at the start, right? Um, that's the first layer of reality. How, how, can, how can this occur, right? And so, you know, in, in a recent paper I have forthcoming with Eric in a, a new Rutledge volume on classical theism, um, we, we, we hint at perhaps different ways that we can um, see this as consistent with classical theism. So, uh, again, the classical theist is going to agree with the Aveda Vedante proponent and say God is um, propertyless, right? Um, I, I, I think, given the way I've articulated what I mean by propertyless or qualityless, you know, the, Aveda, the, the classical theist can agree on all this. And he can agree that. Uh, at the most fundamental la layer of reality, just is God, just as Brahman. It, we exist, but we exist in a lesser extent, just as hobbits exist, uh, uh, or Captain America exists, in a, you know, to, in a lesser sense than we do. Right? So reality and existence is ultimately um, degreed. <coughs> and so, um, yeah, um, uh, we, we, when you view reality like that, then it seems like we can talk about different layers of reality. We can talk about God being propertyless and, 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 and so forth. Um, so, but what do we do about, um, uh, do, we, do we need to, to, to call God impersonal? Well, if God's not supposed to be put into to any sort of category, then, um, then, then it seems like to call him personal would be to put him in, in, in a sort of category that things are in. And so I'd be hesitant to do that, right? Um, so uh, maybe we can just for um, sake of confusion, maybe we just say he's um, not a person. Um, uh, and so maybe we just say that he, he is, we can just say existence itself, right? Um, do we have to endorse any sort of pantheism? I mean, that would be problematic for classical theists. So I emailed um, a, an Aveda Vedante scholar. Uh, he's a really kind guy, really smart guy. He's got some really good work. I, I encourage you to take a look at his work. Um, his name is uh, Ra uh, Ramabakan. And um, uh, he, I emailed him and said, hey, I'm a classical theist, right? Um, can I understand... Aveda Vedante, can I interpret it? I'm not saying this is what everyone interprets it as, right? It's generally interpreted as a pantheist um, tradition. Um, what I uh, said is basically, though, could I? Like the bare fundamentals you lay out for Aveda Vedante, right? Could I interpret Aveda Vedante in this sort of light? Um, so here, I'll, 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 um, I said to him, um, specifically, can the Aveda Vedante... Um, uh, could, could, could it be rightly seen through the lenses of classical theism? Specifically, can the Veda Vedante proponent faithfully view God as ultimate reality and yet argue that some weaker sense distinct objects also exist and participate in Brahman for their existence? Um, 
he responded and said, your language of participation is an interesting possibility. If by participation you mean that nothing exists apart from Brahman, nothing exists independently of Brahman, and while things may have unique attributes, at the most fundamental level of being or existence, all is Brahman. That he thought that that I, I you know, could could think that classical theism was consistent with Aveda Vedanta tradition. And so again, the Aveda Vedanta, the classical theist is going to say, yes, at the ultimate layer of reality, there just is God. We exist in some lesser degree of reality. Um, so anyway, it seems like even on Advaita Vedanta Hinduism, there's there's some grounds, there's some root <laughs> to um, have um, walls sort of taken down, obstacles taken down, room for agreement and saying, actually, if you understand what you're saying like this, then I can agree with you there. You don't have to change your views on this, right? And so... Uh, I, th I think this is what it's important. We, we recognize that Hinduism, that Buddhism has holy truths, that um, they have uh, 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 traditions that lead them to Christ, that can lead them to Christ, that point to Christ. And uh, we, we want to amplify those traditions and those doctrines that are true. And maybe we, we, we develop apologetical arguments, as I have, right? In my World Religions book with Eric Baldwin, um, we develop arguments against kind of atheistic versions of these religious traditions that I've mentioned um, that have to deal with proper function. But, um, you know, um, but if, if we're gonna say like, hey, if we, we, if we interpret your traditions not so atheistically, but in this light, now we're talking and now we have room to talk about the gospel. Anyway, so yeah, that, that's, so that's the idea. So the question that I've got in, in my mind is on the practical side of things. So what do we do if you're actually in a situation where you're talking with a Buddhist or a Hindu, uh, Hinduist, Hindu, if you're talking with someone that's Hindu and, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, what do you, what do you say, Where would you go from there? Like can say that you convince them that, yeah, your view is actually compatible with classical theism. Right. So, but then where would you go? Because you, you said that you have a very high view of scripture and like, you know, that you're, you're an exclusivist sounds like in some sense of the term uh, with yeah, respect to Jesus. And, yeah. So then um, where would you go for like, practically speaking as an evangelist, where would you go from right. there in, in a conversation with someone say that you convince them that, that their view is compatible with classical theism? Where, where would then like, what would the next step be? Right. Yeah. So philosophically, I'm an exclusivist in the way that Planiga talks about exclusivism. Um, soteriologically, I'd be considered inclusivist, very likely. Um, but you know, what I would do is just now it's time to talk about Christ. Let's talk about God, right? Let's talk about ultimate reality, and and so um, uh, I would talk about sin and death, and um, I would provide uh, you know the gospel claims that ultimate reality, pure existence, became man pure actuality, right, um, took on human nature and <clears throat> suffered death um, for their sins on their behalf, right? Um, God, um, I, you know, me as a human being who I'm not attached to any sort of like divine nature, <laughs> um, uh, you know, my human nature, um, I'm, 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 I'm purely human, only human. Um, I fail in lots of different ways. Uh, I don't love God with all of my heart, mind, and strength, um, but Jesus did. Um, he did love God the Father with all his heart, mind, and strength, and he loved his neighbor as himself to the point where he died on the cross. And so I would talk to them about um, how this loving action pleased existence itself, pure actuality, suffering on behalf of your neighbor for their well-being, so much that he raised Jesus from the dead, and that those who turn from their sins and who are baptized, put on Christ through baptism, right? They'll, they'll, they'll be made right with God, and, and, and they'll have their sins forgiven. They'll be justified. They'll be raised in a positive way in the resurrection of the just, just like Jesus was. And so I'd give them the gospel, and I'd say, hey, here's evidence for that, right? And I would start spewing out uh, minimal, uh, maybe I would even start spewing out uh, minimal facts for Fatima <laughs> um, and, and for Marian apparitions as well. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's how I would uh, approach. Um, and I have, I mean, I've, I've gotten, you know, I've got a good Buddhist friend. Uh, he's a Buddhist philosopher. Um, 
publishing in the analytic Buddhist literature. And now he's like very open to theism and very open to Christianity. And that's this is the exact approach that I, I, I took him through. So the one the one concept that I that you mentioned that I was thinking about and, and whether or not it'd be compatible with these other views is is the concept of sin. Is 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 sin like foreign to how well how foreign is it mm. to Buddhism and Hinduism? Right. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, in the book, we, we talk about sin more <laughs> and we talk about karma, right? Um, and so obviously there's this conception of karma and um, there's different ways to have, to understand this conception though, right? There's um, a much more supernaturalist way and then a much more naturalist friendly reductionist way. And so, you know, you, you're probably familiar with the supernaturalist way of understanding karma, right? where there's like this cosmic scale somewhere <laughs> and, um, you know, all your good deeds <laughs> um, are placed on one side of the scale, right? And this is going to produce more goodness for you. It's going to allow you to become enlightened quicker, right? And then you, ha you have this, these bad deeds that are going to prevent that, right? Um, well, we don't need to necessarily go there, right? You can understand karma in just like in a kind of cause and effect way. So, um, you know, I'm tied to you, Cameron, all right, from a Buddhist, especially, I think this, um, I'm, I depend on you, you depend on me, we're all connected together, right, one organism. And um, whatever I do that's good is going to affect you and your enlightenment. And whenever I do bad things, it's going to affect you as well, because we're, we're, we're connected together, it'll, it'll indirectly affect your your enlightenment and so um yeah um uh if you understand it just kind of like this karma like this right where my good actions are going to affect me in reaching enlightenment can affect those around me and my bad actions are going to affect those around me and myself from reaching enlightenment well then we can we can kind of understand karma like this and be christians too right um uh, there's there's no nothing problematic in thinking that uh, that's, that's incompatible with Christian thought, at least that I'm aware of. Um, and so, uh, while, you know, these traditions don't have a, as robust a view of sin and, and, and not as a, a, a heavy doctrine of sin as, as we have, there's, there's still, you know, karma and bad things and good things and that we should avoid and do. And, um, these prevent us from reaching salvation and, you know, help us to reach salvation. So, I mean, you still have basic categories like that. Um, but they don't seem, the basic categories don't seem inconsistent with uh, a Christian way of looking at these things, at least if we're taking this very reductive naturalistic approach. I mean, in Catholic theology, you know, you have um, the doctrine of, of um, you know, be all being in one body, right, in Christ. And, and the saints in heaven uh, have, you know, the treasury of merit and, and can affect our uh, enlightenment, our, our, our uh, beatific vision, our, our holiness, our, our getting to God. And so... Um, yeah, I think there's lots of room to talk about how this is all consistent with one another. Is there anything that we haven't discussed today that you wanted to talk about? Um, no, I think I think that's about it um, for um, those interested what? in uh, kind of a positive view of other religions. Like I said, Gerald O'Collins' book, his Christology of Other Religions, uh, Christology of World Religions, something like that. And then uh, for those who want to trace the doctrine that I've sort of de developed about how you can be a Christian, be believing in Christ without actually knowing it, um, uh, seeing how that develops over time. Francis Sullivan has a very good um, book on this. Um, and uh, yeah, and if you're interested in how theism can be seen as consistent with Buddhism um, or, you know, these other religious traditions, just look at my work. Uh, as as an example of that, got more stuff coming out that's in this category, um, or email me and talk to me uh, if you have any questions. All right, I think that's going to do it for us today. I'm, I'm I, again. I just wanted to apologize for all the technical issues that we've had, and even now, like Tyler's screen, he may have even just frozen. <laughs> uh, we've just we've run into so many different technical issues uh, in this stream, but it, it, we've gotten through it, and there's a lot of valuable information I think that we were able to get through. So, Tyler. Great do, to have you back on the show. Any, do we want to see if there's any super chats or do we, are we, are we just going to go ahead and close it down? Yeah, I think it's best to, to close it out. I mean, okay. uh, with Sounds the, good. with the technical. Yeah. So, 
Um, we, and we haven't had any super chats or anything that have come through, okay. but we'll, we'll definitely do some more work together. So this is not the last time that, uh, that you and I, oh, I, mean, I mean, maybe the next time we can do just a, a Q and a on world religions, Q&A. like that might be, that might be Sounds fun. Good. Something, something like that. So, all right. Well, appreciate you guys tuning in today with us and we will see you in the next capturing Christianity video happening very soon. So see you guys soon. Hey, it's me again. Uh, actually, don't leave yet. I've got something super, super important to tell you. So first of all, you're awesome. Like you you just watched a really, really long video just now and you're still watching it. That is actually pretty amazing. Secondly, we have hundreds, literally hundreds of other apologetics related videos for you to watch on our channel. Go check them out. I've interviewed exorcists, hosted debates between Christians and atheists. I've even made response videos to atheists. All of that is available on our channel. Go check it out. Third, I rely on people that see value in my work, people like you that watch videos to the very end to keep the lights on around here. Literally, this is how I feed my family. So if you see value in the work that I do, please consider supporting